Okay. Welcome to another episode of Stratos Founder Journeys podcast. Um, I'm Daniel Scribner, and today I'm joined by Renick Pally, who's the founding partner of Stratos, as well as Scott Dykstra, who's the co-founder of Space and Time, to talk about um, how Space and Time is building the world's first decentralized data warehouse to power incredibly fast analytics at enterprise scale. Renick, Scott, thank you so much for joining me. Excited to be here. Thanks for bringing me on. Thanks, Scott. So I'll go... I'll go ahead and ask the, the first question. Um, Scott, just to start, can you share a little bit about your background and talk just at a really high level, because we're going to go many, many levels deeper over the course of this interview, but just talk at a very high level about what you're solving at Space and Time and what you're building. Yeah, absolutely. So at a high level, it's the first Web3 native data warehouse. We believe that Web3 needs its own data platform, something built from the ground up for Web3 that's truly decentralized, but also brings enterprise scale and kind of enterprise compute, enterprise SLAs to Web3 while being truly decentralized. Web3 projects are starting to generate a lot of data and they need, they're starting to, the needs for analytics are growing. And that's what Web, that's what space and time is bringing to Web3. And talk a little about, just to uh, go, I guess, one level deeper there, talk about why enterprise scale is important. It sounds like maybe part of that is that the projects and just the ecosystem of Web3 have kind of moved beyond consumer grade, you know, technical infrastructure. Am I getting that right? Or why is bringing enterprise scale kind of important yeah. to Web3 now? Yeah, I think we, we can separate the idea of enterprise scale, but not necessarily for the enterprise, right? Enterprise scale for, for dApps, for decentralized apps that are that are starting to scale up past the 50 gigabyte, past the 100 gigabyte, past the PostgreSQL, or even past the MongoDB size data volumes. And those, those solutions I just mentioned are very much storage and retrieval. Data in, data out, like storage and retrieval, not necessarily advanced analytics, making predictions around data and scaling up data in a, in a predictive way. Or, or, or analyzing larger volumes like the terabyte scale that we're finally starting to see in Web3. The blockchains themselves like, are starting to generate hundreds of terabytes. Uh, Solana is aiming at four petabytes a year. Now, of course, that's not four petabytes of usable data. That's probably half a, half a petabyte of usable data. But half a petabyte of usable data is, is mind-blowing, right? That's something we, we've never seen in Web3 before. And so when, I, when we talk about enterprise scale, we're not necessarily saying it's for the enterprise. Now, I'll caveat by saying there are plenty of enterprises that are moving into Web3, and we're excited to see that. We're excited to see a lot of adoption, um, you know, moving up kind of the, the Fortune 500 stack and, and interest from, you know, the, the chief digital strategy officer, digital transformation officer that, uh, of major corporations. But dApps, they need SLAs, right? They need to be able to manage um, terabytes of data, and they need a solution that, that has, uh, you know, high availability, and, and kind of, um, you know, uptime, the, the uptime required that, that enterprises ask for. So um, would love to go into more detail about that, but I think that your background really positions you perfectly to see this opportunity. So, you know, we, we were having dinner the other day talking about how you got sucked into Web3 can you just like summarize that story and, and how you, you came from Web2 and, and Enterprise Cloud into space and time? Yeah, I have to sadly admit that I, I was the guy that thought crypto was a scam. Um, I, would, I had no interest in blockchain or crypto. And then thankfully, uh, I met the right people. Um, I met a bunch of folks at Chainlink initially, actually, that started talking to me about decentralization and the, the conversation on decentralization is so much different than an outsider's conversation on what crypto is, right? Yep. The con if, you, if you enter this Web3 world from the, the angle of decentralization, it's, so much, it's, it's, it's such a more interesting way to enter it. And then you realize, no, actually, like crypto is going to take over the world. And there's such a, there's such a need for it of, of a decentralized currency and smart contracts as control points for transfer of value of this decentralized on the blockchain. You start with this world of decentralization. You're like, wow. Moving, like I spent the last decade support uh, as a, you know, 
executive at Teradata supporting the centralization of data into enterprise data warehouses, these massive cloud-based single points of control, centralized systems with lack of transparency. And you say, okay, wait, the next generation, the web three generation of data processing and data analytics and data warehousing will be fully decentralized with, with no single point of control, community owned, community operated, user owned, user operated um, kind of clusters for data. Then we get back to this concept of, okay, maybe we can actually return privacy to the internet's constituents. And maybe the internet's constituents can actually own this infrastructure in a decentralized way. And if that's your starting point, then the next thing you start learning about is smart contracts. You're like, oh my God, smart contracts are the control points for this decentralized world, for this decentralized data, for this, this transfer of value from tokens, right? Um, and, and since smart contracts are the control point, then you say, okay, Smart contracts are enabling a whole new set of use cases that I never would have imagined even years ago, like three, four years ago, never would have thought that that would be the world we live in today. And then finally, you arrive at tokens and you say, okay, maybe crypto is not a scam. Maybe crypto is going to take over <laughs> the world. And maybe I've been missing out on one of the most exciting changes in technology that I've ever seen. And, you know, and here I am. Yeah. And once, so, once, you so, that, once you know that, you can't leave. You, you can't go yeah. back. Well, you, you came at it in a very different way from a lot of people um you came at it from you know enterprise level cloud data management yep and that you know what, what everyone points to i mean you know there was the the moxie piece that came out uh, you know last year about how well crypto is mostly decentralized blockchains running on otherwise centralized services right and so like you saw how centralized that is in at Teradata. And so for you to go from there to space and time is literally the most direct jump from something that's incredibly centralized into designing a system that's very decentralized. Um, and I'd love to understand why you think decentralization is actually really important here for enabling the functionality that you guys are building. Yeah, good question. I. I think we have a long ways to go in Web3. I think the first, okay, so I started building dApps. The second I learned about smart contracts, I said, oh my God, I got to jump in and, and I got to start get my hands on some of this technology. And when you start building dApps, decentralized apps, you start realizing like there's no mature tools for data management that are native to Web3. You start to realize that, oh man, everyone's still building on the same decade old databases that um, kind of, marred the last century or the last century, the last decade of, of centralization you realize that every single founder you talk to is it kind of has a black and white development pattern and, and they have two choices right they have either fully on chain 100 percent on chain or kind of building on the same tools that we've been building on for the last decade the mongodbs and the postgresqls i talked to maybe like 40 50 founders um of different projects that were starting to generate a lot of off-chain data like data data sets that were too big to fit on chain right what everything on chain is primarily events and transactions right Pr primarily the transfer of value data associated with the transfer of value and events associated with the transfer of value you think about like a blockchain based video game or a play to earn game right uh on chain will be all the in-game purchases maybe if someone got if, if someone got paid to win the game then it's it's the end game results that paid them out on chain but there's orders of magnitude more data, maybe multiple orders of magnitude more data generated in game, like all the in game activity, where the player went, what the player did, the the chat, the interactions, the, the you know the, the kill to death ratio in in a, like a shoot, first person shooter, right? And and all of that we realized is still built on Web two infrastructure. It's all being dumped into MongoDB or dumped into PostgreSQL, and that's fine, that's okay. But the big problem is. It's back to a single point of control, lack of transparency. It's an analytic black box. The community has no idea what's being done with that data. And most importantly, that data cannot be connected over to a smart contract. That's a one-way street. You can read data from the blockchain. You can index data from major chains and put that in your analytic black box, put that in your web two database. And that's fine. And you can do your own analytics in a silo as the organization running that blockchain based game, that play to earn game. But you can never connect the results coming out of that black box, the analytics that you derive back to the chain, right? It's a one, you can read from the chain, but you can never write back to it because Why that's not? not a trustless system. 
Right. We lost you for a second. Oh, I was just, I was just, you know, sitting back and thinking like, um, at the end of the day, right. The community, I believe the, the, the blockchain community as a whole, and especially like DeFi and, and play to earn are going to want to see more transparency. They're going to want to see that their data is being analyzed in a, on decentralized infrastructure. And they kind of want to know what's going on with that data. Like, and most importantly, more importantly than all of that, whether the community pushes that or not, the future that I see is that we'll need to connect analytics to our smart contracts. And the only way we can connect analytics to our, or qu- I should say query results, the only way we, we connect queries to smart contracts, connect an off-chain database to a smart contract, will require decentralization and trustless off-chain compute. And trustless off-chain compute requires proofs, requires transparency. It requires that th- those running the database can actually prove the results. And you can't do that with a centralized system. You can't do that with the, the, the centralized data warehouses that you know were, were the, the defining point solutions of the last decade. That's, that's all, that's, that was kind of what I realized. And so then you said, time to go start space and time. I'm, I mean, I'm how did you get it. connected so, with Nate? Like, to tell yeah. us a little bit about the, the founding story. And, and obviously you had this idea, this concept of where the technology needs to go to serve web three correctly. Right. That's what you were just talking about. But how did you go from that idea in your head to space and time now? Yeah. Good, really good question. And, and it was tough, right? So I, I worked with Terra with, with Nate for a long time. Can you, can you give a little bit of background on Teradata for us? Yeah. Uh, I think Teradata is a, a fantastic da- data warehouse. It's one of the, it, you know, it's one of the longest, uh, one of the oldest, one of the earliest, and also kind of one of the most mature for the enterprise. Like you think about like the, the apples, the, the, the Southwest airlines, the Walmarts, the Wells Fargo's of the world all run their entire business on, on Teradata. Like Apple runs 40,000 queries a day on Teradata. And, and that's, that's the maturity of an enterprise data warehouse that has all the tools to manage that extremely high concurrency, hundreds, even thousands of users hitting the system throughout the day, asking very complex questions of their data. And, it's all about delivering very, very highly distributed systems across thousands of nodes, both on-premise and in the cloud. Um, the challenges, though, is that those systems do not—they um, don't move and shake. They don't upgrade easy. Like you, you can't you can't go from version three to version four overnight, right? You, these are massive monolithic systems that are, you know, that are kind of these big giants that are installed. And once they're installed, good luck, good luck changing anything, right? Um, Nate, I, I met Nate at Teradata. Nate was an up and coming executive with very ambitious goals to, you know, kind of, um, reorganize operations and sales. And he was doing a really good job leading sales at Teradata. And we, we became good friends probably eight years ago. We both, uh, Nate actually was the first person to enter the world of web three. Nate, Nate began advising Chainlink and, and connected with Sergey at Chainlink and was, uh, kind of built a relationship there. And he was all in from the beginning. He's like, dude, we, we got to get into to, to DeFi, right? We need to start figuring out our smart contract strategy. Like we got to do something with analytics and DeFi. And I said, cool, man, like I'm busy. <laughs> I said, cool, I'm busy, you know? And he kept trying to convince me. And then of course I made my way into speaking with folks at Chainlink as well. And then Ch- Chainlink is a good bridge. And I don't mean a good, br- a good not the web three term bridge, yeah. right? I'm not talking yeah. about Oracle bridges. Chainlink is a good bridge from going from the world of enterprise data to blockchain. Why? Chainlink's core business, I thought when I first kind of started speaking with folks at Chainlink, I thought their core business was connecting off-chain data to smart contracts, connecting off-chain data to the blockchain. But the more I got to understand them, really their core business is capabilities to make smart contracts smarter, enabling more and more like smart contract capabilities and that includes bringing off-chain data into smart contracts to make them smarter, right? That, that, that's one of the capabilities that really the world has found a lot of use for right away. Understanding how Chainlink bridges the world of centralized data and like bringing off-chain data onto the blockchain was a really good starting point for thinking through, okay, what would the next generation, the Web3 generation of data warehousing look like? Because that is essentially going to be off-chain compute. And it needs to be trustless off-chain compute. And it needs to be trustless access to that data to bring it on-chain. So it was like, 
the, the three steps were actually four steps were growing a career in the world of seeing what the largest web fortune 500 enterprises do with data meeting Nate and Nate forcing me into web three and saying, you don't have a choice, Scott, you've got to understand, you've got to look at smart contracts. Cause if you don't, you're missing out on the biggest change in the internet in our lifetimes. And then understanding how valuable Chainlink's technology has become and how useful it is for bringing off chain data on chain and mo more importantly for making smart contracts smarter. And then of course, all right, what would the, the next gen architecture look like? So then, so then I spent a whole year trying to figure out, okay, I need to work with the best PhD level kind of engineers and, and, and thinkers in this space. I can, I need to bring on folks like, like the CTO of Teradata as one of our advisors. I need to bring on, you know, folks in the Apache aerospace that are not, not Apache aerospace, the Apache aero space um, to, you know, think through like uh, some really next generation analytic technology that can power this. We need to think through cryptography and how we're actually going to build like ZK snark specifically for queries and, for, and specifically for SQL that's going to connect this database to the blockchain. And that was a long journey. That was a whole year of engineering and architecting and research and just like working with the smartest people I could to say, okay, we only get one chance at this. We can't just like tinker a little bit, try one thing. It doesn't work. All right. Let's, we, these are big systems. These are hundreds of nodes. The, the, you know, it's not like we can just play around with a little smart contract and then try again next week. Oh, it didn't really work. No, we need to figure out the right architecture. And then once we do, we're off to the races. And that's where we're at now. We're scaling up the team quickly and, you know, we're, we're, we're building this thing out pretty, pretty fast. Yeah, it's a great overview of, I think, what you're building and why it's interesting. I, I want to, well, I, th I think we should move on in a second and talk a little bit about use cases. But before we kind of continue, I want to pause for a second because, you know, as somebody who isn't an engineer, I kind of vaguely understand what a data warehouse is. And I vaguely understand what analytics are. I would love to understand that a little bit deeper sure. and to just help everybody listening that maybe doesn't get what that's doing, what that's powering to try to flesh that out. I think it might be interesting to explore that Apple example and talk a little bit about one, what is a company like Apple storing in a data warehouse? And then when you talk about queries, what, it, what does that look like and what are those queries and what are people doing in those queries? What information are they trying to get? Can yeah. you just kind of frame that up for us? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's good background to have. So Apple has a ton of apps, more apps than just about any other, you know, Fortune 500 company out there. And each of those apps needs a transactional database to kind of store and retrieve data for that app. So you think about um, something like um, Apple Maps. That's a, not a great example, but that's the first thing that came to mind. Uh, you know, the, in the, there's, there's a, a scalable database that just kind of, stores and retrieves data, quick lookups, quickly look up my path to the restaurant I'm going to for lunch, quickly, quickly look up my path from my home office to the Stratos HQ in Newport someday, right? Look up, <laughs> look up my, um, my recent transactions, my recent activity, what were my recent uh, trips that I made, right? It's very kind of transactional, very fast, like point, point zero 0.01 second lookups or 0.1 second lookups, <clears throat> like look up quick things, my, my account. And, and comparing that to Web3, it'd be like DAPs would be saying, hey, look up uh, Renick's recent trend transactions on Polygon. Look up, um, you know, Daniel's uh, recent, um, you know, DeFi activity around Aave, you know, re recent loan transactions, whatever it may be, right? And, and, and then a data warehouse, right, is this concept that Apple has all these different applications, not just Apple Maps. They have hundreds more. And, and they have business applications that power their business internally. They have external consumer facing applications like Apple Maps. They have cut enterprise facing applications where they're providing, providing value to the enterprise. And all these applications have their own databases that power kind of the very quick transactions of that, those apps. But a data warehouse sits underneath all of that and connects all of that data across their business in one massive system with thousands of, well, Hundreds of nodes for most customers. In the case of Apple, I think Apple is over a thousand nodes of big hardware with, you know, petabytes level storage and connecting all of the insights across their entire business so that business analysts internally can make bigger decisions, ask bigger questions about the business, understand financial reporting, compliance, things like that across their whole business. Like it's, it's connecting insights across all these different apps. And it's not just apps, right? It's any, any data set across their business. 
These organizations need a single source of the truth, one massive system that has the compute power to ask the big questions and the storage volumes to capture all this data. That's really how you think about a data warehouse. And the, the first generation of that was Teradata. Teradata was one of the earliest and most scalable data warehouses of its day, primarily deployed in private data centers, single points of control, highly centralized, deployed by these big Fortune 500 companies. And then companies like Snowflake and, Snowflake and Databricks came in and said, you know, we love what you've done, Teradata. We're proud of you, Teradata. But maybe it's time to build something cloud native that kind of you don't have to deploy this monolithic 1,000 node system to get started. You can deploy one node in the cloud and scale up as you as you want, right? If you have 10 sure. terabytes, great, we can deploy 10 terabytes. If you have 500 gigabytes, great, we can handle 500 gigabytes. If you have 300 terabytes, great, we can we can scale up to that kind of elastic auto scaling in the cloud that was very key for the last, I don't know, five years and will still be key for the next five years. However, there is still one more generation of data warehousing that's required. And that is the web three native generation, which is not so much about monolithic systems versus cloud auto scaling. It's much more about centralization versus decentralization and opening up trustless analytics that we can actually connect to smart contracts. I'll stop yeah, there. I it's just fascinating. Know. No, no, no. I think that, that was, was fascinating. Awesome. And, that was great. And your yeah. details around how Apple would use it, I think, were really interesting. So just to recap, and it sounds like a data warehouse is a central repository that a company is storing all of its data. And that can be across a number of different touch points, a number of different applications. It is, in fact, basically a monolithic system. And so what's important is obviously storage, speed, performance, uptime, all of those pieces. And I just want to clarify one more, one more point which is around nodes. My guess is that the reason nodes are important is almost like a CDN. You're basically reducing latency by having a bunch of these endpoints that you can use to retrieve. Am I off on that? Or can you talk a little bit about why having a number of nodes is important and, and how that kind of shows up in a Web3 sense? Yeah. Um, a CDN is, a, is maybe not the, the best analogy in that it's not a bunch of endpoints. It's usually actually one kind of one way to access the data, but the, the, the nodes are needed for compute power, right? You're, you're okay. wiring a bunch of nodes together using InfiniBand or some big network bandwidth. In the case of, of, in the case of data warehouses deployed in the cloud, it's using the network backbone of AWS or the heavy network backbone of Azure, right? Big old network backbone connecting these big old servers together so that sure. a query can process joins. At the end Got of the it. day, it really comes down, believe it or not, it just comes down to the ability to run a query which joins two or more tables together. When you're joining a bunch of tables together, those tables are distributed across tons of nodes, lots of hardware. And you need a lot of memory. You need a big old network pipe between those nodes so that you can say, hey, show me some analytics or show me some, show me a query result which joins my customer transactions with my in-game activity uh, in the case of a play to earn game, like a play to earn game asking the question of like, all right, show me my on-chain blockchain transactions and join that with some of my in-game activity so I can understand what happened during the play to earn game that led to an on-chain transaction. That's joining big data sets together. And those big data sets might be distributed over tons of, of, of hardware, a lot, a lot of nodes, right? And that, so we need a big old network bandwidth, big old uh, network pipe between them. To, to, to facilitate that join, to facilitate that, that analytic process. Yeah. So it's um, like networked computers and networked computing basically at the end of the correct. day. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, you, you, th you think about like the next generation of what that will be. And I, I hate to get, I hate to talk about data warehousing too much with space and time because that's not really our, our, that's not really the, the target we're aiming for. Because at the end of the day, Web 2 was all about point solutions, right tool for the right job. Like I said, using the Apple example, you have all these little databases that power the app because they're, they're very fast for storage and retrieval. And then you have your big old data warehouse that sits underneath that as a single point, as a single repository, like you said, Daniel, for all that data. However, that concept of point solutions also needs to be replaced. We need, we need to think about a data platform that can do both. The very fast storage and retrieval, it can power dApps, it can power applications, it can, it can do that very fast, show me Daniel's recent transactions on Polygon, but also do the scalable analytics across big nodes with a big network and you know, handle those, that, all that crunching of numbers during a big join. So for a video game, it would be like a single platform that can do 
uh, pull up Daniel's account to load the game. 0.1 second. Also, show me the likelihood that players like Daniel will continue to make purchases in game and the lifetime value of those players. A big job that crunches tons of data across tons of transactions. And we need a data platform that does both for Web3. Why? Because if we don't, then we're going to have these, this disjointed kind of architecture where, where dApps and games are deploying little databases and data warehouses, and it'll increase the centralization of these tools because mm -hmm. the, the community won't have transparency into wh where the data is being moved around. Like, oh, they've got some data here doing storage and retrieval. They have some data down here in space and time doing analytics. You just need one platform that's connected to the blockchain that feels like a blockchain. And what, what is a blockchain, right? Blockchains are not about point solutions, about, all right, you use one little blockchain tool for this. Most customers are like, all right, look, blockchains are, are powerful systems that like can do a lot, right? Like you, 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 we're seeing more and more multi-chain strategies where people are using different blockchains for different, for different use cases. But regardless, it's like you build on the blockchain. You don't have like, uh, you don't have like a, um, a blockchain for storage retrieval and a blockchain for <laughs> analytics, right? You need your block, your, you need your blockchain for your transactions. All sure. I'm trying to say is what web three needs is a data platform that can do both that can power the, 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 the database style workloads of storage and retrieval very fast and the data warehouse style workloads of analytics. Mm -hmm. The reason that the last thing I'll say is the reason that never really caught on in web two. And believe me, there were people that tried is because there was no real reason to, right? It, people kind of wanted centralization, right? They wanted single points of control. They wanted point solution tools where they could be highly, highly efficient for one specific job. There was no requirement that said, okay, we need one data platform to do both of these types of workloads. And technically one data platform that can handle both of the types of workloads may not be quite as micro efficient as using the exact tools for each. But if you just say, okay, if it's still pretty efficient, if it's pretty darn efficient, it may not be the fastest, most efficient thing for each, but it's still pretty efficient. Then for Web3, it solves a lot of the challenges of developers. It allows DAP developers to get up and running very quickly with an analytic or data backend that powers their DAPs, but also powers their analytics and connects them to the blockchain. Just make it easy for DAP developers, please, finally. Like, I've been building DAPs for a while, and I hate that I have to deploy all these different things. I have to figure out my smart contract strategy, and I'm like, okay, so I dump data in MongoDB, and then what if I need analytics? Oh, but they're centralized. Like, no, we've got to make this easy for DAP developers to get them up and running quickly. I'll stop there. So, well said. yeah, I think, I, I, think you're, I think you're wading into now some of the more interesting aspects of the architecture of space and time and, and how you guys have designed it. So, and I know, you, I know you've been chomping at the bit to, to go into more detail there. So I'd like to know, like, so first of all, the, the terminology of nodes in web three and nodes in web two and traditional cloud are different. And, you know, you're using that term to talk about what Teradata's architecture look like and really to talk about parallelizing some of that compute, but, now today, looking at Web3 and what you guys are designing, it's actually a completely different architecture that still uses nodes, but actually in a way they're to some degree repeating the same computation of, of other nodes um, and, and actually uh, doing that for a specific reason. Um, and it's to create this decentralization and trustlessness that is necessary. And one of the things that you talked about was well, if you're feeding data back into a smart contract, it can't come from a single point, right? Because if it comes from a single point, that's a very clear attack vector that then you can spoof the data, you know, create whatever inputs that you want. And then suddenly you're, you may as well just be building in, in web two at that point. Right. Right. So like, how did you, how'd you solve this problem? How'd you design space and time? Like from our view, it's completely novel. We haven't seen any other solution similar to this. Um, the, the, the analog that we use is, you know, we, we're also significant investors in this project called Pocket Network. And Pocket Network is like the antidote to Infura and all the issues they've had because they themselves are a centralized RPC network. Now, space and time has a lot of similarities to that. Obviously, they're, they're not competitive. It's this is more of a data storage analytics as opposed to um, you know, real-time compute, but 
would love to get your input on this and you know we can talk a little bit more about the the technical aspects here yeah it's i think the pocket analogy is a good one i mean i'm a big fan of michael and what they're doing at over a pocket I, I i think it's a really interesting project and i'm very bullish on what they're working on um also maybe you know soon using some of his data for rpc you know to getting getting data into space and time from from, from blockchain nodes one thing that's interesting about pocket is like this idea that can kind of almost like rent the capabilities of blockchain nodes from blockchain node operators around the world. Or I hate to use the word rent because it's not a great word, but it's not really mining either. It's it's some some something in between of like, hey, uh, Scott is a um, avalanche node operator and he has his own little data center or he's got a bunch of nodes in his basement because that's what he loves to do. And he's mining Avalanche and he provides RPC or, or, or uh, for, for, for those that aren't familiar, for data from the blockchain, you know, basically a way for other services to request data from his nodes. And what that allows a service like Pocket to do is scale up this kind of big network of user provided nodes and user provided data services where someone who has the ability to run blockchain nodes can also earn extra revenue from providing data services to other services like space and time provide data to me and i'll pay for that data because our our network needs access needs reading from the blockchain right we need access to that blockchain data of course in a minute we're going to talk about writing back to the blockchain using cryptography but the first thing we need to do is access all that blockchain data so we can index it, so we can build our own analytics on it, and so we can provide that as a service to our customers, the developers and, and dApps building on top of space and time. They all need that data. But I don't have time to run my own blockchain nodes for eight different blockchains, nor do I want to. I don't want to be in that business. That's not what I'm good at. I'm, I'm much better at analytics than at running hardware. you know. And so that... It's the, it's the true decentralization of a blockchain node data service where data services are provided in a decentralized way. Like I might be getting my data from Pocket Network, but what I'm really getting my data from is some gentleman in, um, in Shanghai or something, right? Like who's running his own nodes. Who knows? Thousands of nodes around the world. You could randomly be pulling data from each one. It's the Pocket Network that handles that for you. And so you know the data is coming to you from the blockchains in a way that's trustless, right? And so then it gets to you. And so like highly the, and highly fault tolerant. Exactly. And and now with extremely low latency, in fact, better performance than even Infura and the rest. And so looking at that and saying, okay, if instead you had gone through Infura, you'd be going through one centralized party and then the whole the whole chain would have been, you know, muddied in that sense. Yeah, it's so, hard. It's it's harder to prove cryptographically or in a trusted or in a verifiable way that you're getting, uh, you know, trustless data. Uh, you know that yeah. that 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 there wasn't anything, because it, look, it's this concept that no, no one's worried that there's employees at Infura that are changing the data for whatever reason, but we have to be cryptographically guaranteed. The whole point of a smart contract is that it's trustless, is that you can't tamper with it. And just the fact that you could tamper with a centralized system means it, it will not work for this use case. So you need trustless tamper-proof systems that are cryptographically guaranteed and verifiably on-chain so that you can provide data to smart contracts. Because yeah. if not, then you really can't, then you can only use data for other centralized use cases. If you want to use data inside your smart contracts on-chain, then you, you have to ensure that data is coming from a trustless kind of cryptographically guaranteed solution. So now yeah. let's compare so that. So the policy. weakest link in the chain, if the weakest link in yeah. the chain is a centralized component and it's flowing back on chain, then at that point, it's almost not even worth using a blockchain. And so Pocket's a solution to that part, but then it couples with space and time, which is a solution to the, the data warehousing, the analytics, everything else that's going back on chain, right? So yeah. So let's, see, let's use that analogy then to, to talk about the decentralized network that is space and time. Space and time is a decentralized network of clusters. Not, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say 
they're not really nodes because it's multiple nodes in a cluster, but anybody can run a cluster. So think about instead of, you know, 100 nodes, it's 100 clusters of nodes. And those clusters could be small. They could be only three nodes each. Or they could be massive. They could be 120 nodes each, right? Uh, it depends on who's operating them and the, the use cases and, and what they want to do, right? Like I'm going to mine my own space and time cluster that's going to be massive. I'm probably going to deploy like 100 node space and time cluster because I want to because I believe in space and time, <laughs> of course. But, but you know, but uh, anyone can do that permissionless, my, right? My, um, you know, one of my one of my buddies down the street one of my neighbors can say, hey, Scott, I heard you're doing some crazy blockchain thing. I want to be involved. I'm like, oh, great. Like, we can set up a little three-node cluster in your basement that you can manage, right? Or or a better example would be like a partner, uh, you know, one of these blockchain-based play to earn games pulling their own cluster at, um, you know, they deploy 10 nodes in the cloud or 10 nodes in their data center. But they only actually need, on a day-to-day -day basis, the compute power and the data storage volumes of about three nodes. But we encourage them to deploy 10 and basically rent out or mine out the extra seven nodes of compute or storage to the rest of the network so that other customers and other uh, network participants can leverage that compute and leverage that storage. And so it's this idea that we have hundreds of clusters around the globe provided by uh, partners, the community, users, um, you know, cloud partners like Microsoft, even right, like whoever wants to participate, we don't care. It could be participate. It could be run in Renix basement, or it could be run, you know, in a private data center. It's contributing to a public network of transparent, like trustless compute, where we know what's happening on these different clusters. We know the kind of data that's being stored and the kind of questions that are being asked, and the it is transparent to the community. But more importantly, we can prove everything on chain. The data coming in is cryptographically guaranteed. It's logged and it's, and, it's, and it's put on chain through Merkle trees. And the data coming out, the analytics that they're running is also provable so that we can connect it to a smart contract. I'll stop there. And so, and so are, you, are you referencing data uh, analytic outputs from multiple clusters that are replicating similar outputs to ensure that the actual data going back on chain has been... Uh, it is certified to be, you know, not tampered with and, and come out correctly. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting. I shouldn't say it. the short answer is no. That's a really interesting question, and that was actually our original designs and our the very first, you know, moment we started thinking about what a decentralized data warehouse was. Remember, we were coming from a chain link kind of uh, right. view of the market, and. Chainlink is all about replicated activity to come to consensus, like right. re replicate a job 16, 30 times and come to consensus on it, right? That will never work with data warehousing. Remember. Why? Why? Well, that's what I'm about to say. Remember that some of these jobs are very quick, storage and retrieval, 0.1 second. But most of these jobs are very complex. Even some of the simple, like, quote, transactional queries can get very complex. Like, even just something as simple as, show me Renix recent transactions on Polygon, that might take, that, that takes a lot of compute because we got to sort through a lot of people and a lot of transactions and we got to find that. So the compute power required and the amount of storage required to even answer some of the most simple queries is way too heavy to, to do that in a repeated way 16 or 30 times and come to consensus. It's not mm -hmm. going to work. And especially mm -hmm. when you get into big analytics, the, the data warehousing types of workloads where we're asking bigger questions like show me the likelihood of Renick, of, 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 of users like Renick to continue to make these kinds of purchases on chain, accessing tons of data, joining multiple tables together uh, and, and, and doing kind of more, more of a predictive process, for example. That's too much compute. That's too much storage. You can't replicate it 16, 30 times and come to consensus on it. Instead, what you need is novel cryptography. You basically need a ZK snark specific for SQL. You need a cryptographic approach where the database can not just calculate the, the query result, but also generate a proof of the query result. And that proof, proof is concrete. It is cryptographically guaranteed. And a validating layer that sits between the blockchain and the database. And by the way, someday it'll be a blockchain itself. Right? We'll get there one step at a time. Today it's a validating layer. Tomorrow it'll be a blockchain. But that validating layer accepts the query result and the proof. It looks at, it compares the proof to its own um, kind of commitments that it's made of the data as the data came into the network. And it says, okay, wait, this query result from this outsourced database running in Renix basement 
is accurate, is valid, is it is it is verifiable. We we trust that that computation. We're now ready to send it to a smart contract. That is a, a logically doing the same thing as Chainlink, but right. physically the, 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 it's 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 a completely different approach. It's a cryptographic approach rather than a consensus driven uh, redundancy approach. Well, it has the potential to be significantly less expensive and, and more performant too, right? But then this this proof is something that's, you know, to our knowledge, when we first saw you guys working on it, really, you know, novel. There, there's nothing else out there that has been created to do that yet. Can you it's hard. speak to how, how that works and how you got there? And Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was a paper published by some researchers at the University of Michigan a while back around vSQL, virtualized SQL. That was the genesis for this, right? Mm -hmm. We're not using their, their approach, but they some good ideas that led us to get very creative and start thinking through what a ZK snark or, or snark cryptography for, for SQL would look like. From there, it's, it's honestly uh, some creative engineering, right? It's thinking through, okay, look, because we can leverage a validating, a, a validating layer, a validator, a decentralized validating network, which will someday be a blockchain. Today, it's, it's just a, a, a network that sits between, a de it's a decentralized network that feels like a blockchain, which sits between the space and time databases and your blockchain as a customer, wherever you deploy your smart contracts. Yeah. Because we can leverage that, then all data coming into that will be routed to the appropriate cluster. That will be the gateway. That is the, 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 the starting point for data coming in and out of space and time. As data comes in, whether it's from the blockchain or from your, your video game or from your finance protocol or from your enterprise data warehouse or from your weather feed or your sports betting feed, you know, whatever it may be, as data comes into space and time, this validating gateway creates commitments, cryptographic commitments of that data, almost like very um, fancy hashes of all that data. And it does that very efficiently, very um, computationally inexpensively. It's, it's, it's very fast. And it's highly parallelizable. The database itself then has its own, it's, it's a lot of GPU driven research and not all of our clusters will have GPUs, but the ones that do have GPUs will be really freaking fast, really lightning fast at this. They calculate a query result, but also calculate a proof using start cryptography that the validating layer, remember they've stored a bunch of commitments of the data. They can accept that query result and they can accept that proof, and they can compare that proof against their fancy hashes, their commitments that they've already stored of the data. And they can say, ah, it, you think of it like big polynomials, right? Like the, the, the database returns a query result and this massive polynomial, which represents the query result. And then the validating layer can take that and say, all right, let me compare that against my own commitment. Looks good. Everything checks out. We trust you and provide the query result to the smart contract on chain. Now, Let's get even more creative. What would the next step be? We need to build a proof of stake based reputation system that can assign reputation to different clusters and say, hey, Renix cluster that he's running in his data center has been doing this for a long time. We have validated a lot of big queries coming back from Renix data center. We feel pretty darn good about the, the likelihood that Renix uh, space and time cluster is going to spoof anything or provide bad results to bad or, or anything, tamper for anything. And let's let's increase reputation and let's provide him, of course, a, you know, in a proof of stake methodology, let's provide him a bigger stake. Like let's reward him for doing so. And let's give him more important jobs, bigger jobs, more valuable data sets, data sets that are more frequently accessed within space and time. Let's assigning let's we'll start assigning those data sets to Renix cluster because those are very high value data sets. And we have a very highly we feel really good about the, the, the number of queries we've already proofed coming back from Renix cluster. So it's kind of this, it's kind of a combination of cryptography with some creative proof of staking. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. It's an amazing combination of, of really like frontier tech in web three. So, um, and we're really excited to be one of the first significant node operators, cluster operators for space and time. I think, um, you know, it's an awesome thing that As we, are we help uh, our portfolio companies with, especially you guys. Um, but yeah, I appreciate, appreciate the deep dive on the tech. I think it's, it's really uh, super impressive and, and we're really stoked to be backing you guys. It's a lot, it's a lot, of, it's a lot of hard work. So if you're uh, out there and you're listening and you've got some engineering chops, and you want to take on a project this challenging and this big, like we need a lot of help. This isn't like seven, 
seven engineers in a dorm room, like hacking together some, this is like real core engineering. Like we're, we're scaling up to a hundred engineers and we need a lot of help. So this is uh, this is a big project. So yeah, where do you think it goes? Zooming out a little bit, five years from now, you know, Web3 continues to grow significantly. This use case that you're building for is something that, you know, most people don't see yet. You're in a unique position to see where this, where, where the puck is going, so to speak, just given where you've been in your career. What does space and time look like? How big is that market? I think we need to start setting, I think over time, space and time will start setting standards for the Web3 uh, ecosystem of transparency or like the decentralized community. I think space and time will begin to push the community to push their dApps, push the community to push their applications that they're using like the video games that they're playing with or the DeFi protocols that they're using or the insurance platforms that they're um you know doing insurance with or, or like the you know the, the the fintech kind of the the on-chain loans that they're working with the the DeFi and gaming communities and insure tech communities and all other verticals within web3 space and time will push their constituents to push them to open up more and more data more transparency more decentralization, like less and less encrypted data and much more open, public, transparent data that anybody can query, anybody can access. It, uh, you know, analogous to uh, the blockchain, right? The blockchain is open. Like I can, I can index data from any chain and see what's going on. However, enterprises can put private encrypted data on the blockchain, right? Yes, I can access it, but it's encrypted. So then what's the point? And so in a similar way, like people will put encrypted data on space and time, unfortunately. And that's, we can't, we, we want to encourage that because that's, that's an important use, but we also want to decourage that because we want the whole point of using decentralization is that people can, there's transparency. Like there, we can see what's going on across the network. We can understand the data sets and how they're being used and how they're being analyzed and how they're being connected to smart contracts. So that, that's one, one important area. I think, I think space and time will become kind of like at the forefront pushing the messaging, pushing the charge of like, hey, we need open, transparent data, composable data sets that dApps can share, that dApps can collaborate on, and that the world can watch. That's auditable on-chain. The second thing is we'd really like to scale up to hundreds of clusters, right? We'd like to, I'd like to see three or 400 clusters deployed uh, with, a, with a variety of different partners, like not just enterprise partners, not just big dApps, not just like um, people that have data centers, but I'd like to get to a point where people can actually deploy clusters and start mining space and time in a more informal way, like like literally someday in their basement. That'll take time. Um, you know, the, 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 the deployment complexity needs to be driven down a little bit, but it'd be cool to see people, quote unquote, mining space and time on a regular basis, like outside of data centers. That would be huge. Or outside of the cloud or, or, or in the cloud, but like a, a kid at like USC, you know, here in, here in LA can like, you know, set up his own space and time cluster in his little AWS tenant or AWS VPC on, Azure, on, on, on his own Azure tenant or his own AWS VPC. He can set up his own little space and time cluster and start earning some um, crypto for doing so, like really mining it, c true community mining. And then finally, when we accomplish all that, you know, will take over the data ecosystem for Web3, right? We, we, space and time will be core, foundational, fundamental infrastructure with which most dApps will be built on top of. Because why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to build your dApp on top of something that gets you up and running very quickly, has all the compute power and storage you need, and most importantly, contributes to this beautiful world of decentralization that we all believe so strongly in? Yeah, I mean, it's really well said. And I love that uh, it seems like at the highest level, what you guys are really trying to do is raise the bar for you know the ecosystem broadly to one have i think infrastructure that is aligned with the decentralized nature and the transparent nature of what they're building and the values that they're building on but two you know i think what's been interesting for me just following and listening listening to this conversation is realizing that really through decentralization, you can actually improve performance and improve fault tolerance and actually be able to provide better technical infrastructure, which I think is a fascinating, a fascinating perspective. I, I want to wrap up, we've covered a ton of ground. So I want to wrap up by asking just a super high level question, which is, you know, Scott, you talked about, um, you know, this relatively long uh, journey that you guys have been on so far of, you know, being initially extremely skeptical 
kind of entering Web3 through the lens of decentralization, which I think was fascinating, you know, your story there. And then you talked about, you know, spending a year basically laying some of the foundation and trying to figure out what this looks like. As you kind of look back at what you've done so far, what has been maybe the, the biggest challenge you guys have overcome or the biggest challenge you guys have grappled with? And then what's been just surprising, exciting, kind of delighting about working on this after all these years kind of working in Web2? I'm going to give a maybe somewhat surprising answer. It, the, the, the biggest challenge wasn't figuring out decentralization. It wasn't figuring out this novel cryptography, which, by the way, is mind-blowingly complex. And thank goodness we, I, I'm partnered with some uh, really, really strong PhDs in cryptography. One of my co-founders, Jay White, is, is a brilliant mathematician and cryptographer. One of those, you know, one of those gentlemen that like got his PhD when he was like 23 or something in like algebra. And uh, you know, he, he's he's doing all the heavy lifting over there. Thank goodness, because I I read these white papers and I'm like, I get it, but I can't write this code. It's not the cryptography. It's not the decentralization. It's, it's certainly not the smart contracts that we're writing. Although all of these things are very complex and were very big challenges that we have to over that we have had to overcome. But but surprisingly, the biggest challenge is just building a good database that can do fast transactions and scalable analytics two in one. That's actually really hard. It's a really hard challenge. Uh, the reason is because. Uh, databases are very, very architecture driven. Like there's a, there's a different architecture for doing really, really fast transactions, database type of workloads, than a different architecture for doing really scalable analytic workloads. And, and then merging those two architectures together is, is challenging. Now, here's the best part though. I, I never really appreciated Teradata for what it was while I was at Teradata in that Teradata actually did a pretty good job of merging those two together. And I, I never really appreciated it. Why? Because I was such a, a, um, a pusher of the, the right tool for the right job, four point solutions. I was like, well, why would Teradata try to do both? Like you should have a database and you should have a data warehouse. But now looking back, like Teradata actually did a really good job of merging a kind of hybrid row, row formatted data for fast transactions and column, column formatted data for, for scalable analytics. And so we're taking some of those concepts, like with a nod to Teradata there, like, like we learned some good things there. More importantly, um, there's some really interesting open source projects that, that were, you know, kind of built in the last five years that, that, that brought some, some very creative ideas to, to merging those two architectures. And then finally, we took a step back. We said, yo, this doesn't have to be perfect. We can, there's one area where we can maybe have a little leniency, a little leeway on, and that's storage, right? Storage is, is, is pretty cheap compared to compute memory and GPUs and processing, right? If we assume that storage is so much cheaper than compute, then we can, what we can do is we can fix the whole problem of having both those architectures merged into one system by just provisioning a little bit of extra storage. Problem solved, right? Like everyone's been so like, oh, you have to have the most efficient storage possible, but the blockchain taught us no, storage does not have to be efficient at all. The blockchain replicates storage thousands of times. Like, what if you just could replicate storage like 20% more, 30% more, just have a little extra storage that that look that honestly fixes the whole problem. And that opened our mind to like, okay, now we know what we're doing. Now we know exactly how to merge a really fast database with a really scalable analytics platform. The only kind of uh, deficiency we have is a little extra storage, but the compute is highly efficient and we're really excited. But that was that was a challenge. I mean, that was like, Figuring that out was like, when we figured that out, that was like the biggest, like, uh, like weight off my shoulders. Like, okay, we're going to, we're going to kill this thing. We're going to, we're going to knock this out of the park. Yeah. That was the biggest risk or uncertainty you guys had to overcome, I guess, to get to this place in time and to make space and time even possible. Um, Thank you so much for all the time, Scott uh, and, and Rennick. This has been fascinating. For everyone listening, you can learn more about Space and Time by visiting spaceandtime.dev or following Space and Time TV on Twitter. Spaceandtime.io. Got it. Did it just change? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe it redirects. Okay. Uh, Spaceandtime.io. Thank you so much for the time, Scott. Thank you, Rick. Awesome. Thanks, guys. It's been fantastic, guys. We'll speak again soon. Yeah, see you soon. Bye. Thank you, Scott.